Welcome to episode 171. That's right, 171. Johnny Boy Gotti. As we continue our Wise Guys series, get ready because we're going to the murderous 60s, 70s, and 80s of the Mafia in New York City. So, as we broadcast this on the 16th of December, the 35th anniversary of the killing, shooting of boss Paul Castellano of the Gambino family by none other than our guest today, John Gotti. Now, before we get to that, don't forget you can get all involved in everything that we do here off our new social media networks. I'm not going to list them all because they're a lot, but they're down in the show notes. We're kicking the old Bolshevik social networks to the side, and we're bringing in the Patriot uh, social networking in and uh, some of it, like uh, Polar, Polar, it worked pretty good. So, um, boy, you could you could tell the difference. I'll post something on Twitter, and I'll post the same exact thing on Polar. Go back several hours later, and you you look at Polar, and it's got two, three hundred hits, and you go to Twitter, and it's got five. That tells you everything. All right. And and talking about everything, it's time for the word of the week. For whatever thing were written before were written for our learning. That we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. And we can explain more about this on Test Everything 1521, which launches the same day as this podcast. Just go to RaiderCopNation.com. There's a section there that says Test Everything. And there you can hear this word and all the other ones that we have there. They're less than 15 minutes only for your spiritual journey. And we take those journeys along with this podcast every week for your spiritual enrichment. All right. It's time to get the little bus going because we got to travel over to Queens, New York, and we're going to talk about the gangster of gangsters, the gangsters, America's gangster, in the 1980, John Boy Gotti. Born John Joseph Gotti Jr., October 27, 1940, from the Bronx, New York. He would go on to have uh, 13 siblings. He was number five out of the 13. Needless to say, that was a big family. Father jo- John, jo- John Joseph Gotti Sr. and his mother Philom- Philomenia Gotti. The Gotti family would produce five made members and one nephew. And actually, if we include the son, which is no longer a part of the Gambino family, uh, the family members were Gene Gotti, brother, which ended, which would be uh, Capo. John, which the boss, Peter, 
would end up being a boss too. Richard Acapo in 2002. Vincent, he would be made in 2002. And nephew Richard Gotti as well. And then John A. Gotti, which was John Gotti's son, which would reach the level of capo and he also reached the level of boss and then he walked away from everything. So, <clears throat> John Gotti would be convicted in 1975 of attempted manslaughter and we're going to backtrack a little bit. How did he get there? 1973, Gotti's crew would attempt to kidnap an Irish gangster by the name of James McBratney. Now, McBratney had kidnapped Carlo Gambino's nephew, and they were negotiating for months, <clears throat> trying to bring the nephew back, and the Irish gangsters ended up killing Gambino's nephew. As a result, Gambino ordered standing order in the family, find who did this, and torture and kill them. Those contracts went out to all prospective members. They, that means they were going to be future members to make their bones. And John Gotti was high on that list. Now, when Gotti would get convicted of this, he was his attorney would be Roy Cohen, which was the famous mob lawyer and personally hired by Carlo Gambino to get Gotti off or a lesser sentence in this uh, manslaughter case. Now, upon the release of John Gotti in 1977, he would become a made man. Carlo Gambino passes away in 1976, leaving his brother-in-law Paul Castellano as boss he left standing orders that were well received, especially by the underboss, Neil De La Croce, that when Gotti got out, he was to become a made member for the service that he had done to Carlo Gambino with the Irish gangster James McBratney. Now, McBratney was abducted or attempted abducted in a bar in New York City in 1973. And they walked in with phony police shields, uh, Gotti and two other guys. And when they approached him, McBratney on the bar, uh, they flashed the police shields and they told him to come along with with them. Uh, the guy goes, he looked at him and goes, you, you guys are not cops. He you know, immediately kind of picked it up. And so a little struggle ensues at the bar, a little pushing and shoving, and a commotion erupts, and one of the guys that were Gotti, they called him the wig, he said, to hell with this, and he pulled his gun out and he shot McBrandy two or three times in the head, killed him and, and fled. And... Um, this trial, will go, I mean, the case was pretty much had witnesses of who had committed the murder and all this other stuff. But Gotti was not one of the people that were picked out by uh, civilians in the mug, looking at mugshots. The other two were. So it gave Gotti a little bit more time to, to go on the lam. And uh, this whole deal was negotiated. He would go to prison in the time he would serve, and Roy Cohn would be his attorney and so forth. So Gotti ended up, uh, I think it was a four-year sentence. He really did two years with good behavior. He, they opened up the cell doors and let him out in July 1977, where he would become <clears throat> a made member. And Paul Castellano would preside as the boss of the Gambino family in that ceremony. Uh, shortly after John be became a made member, he would be placed as acting capo of his old crew 
and the captain of his old crew, Carmine Faccio, would go into semi-retirement and then retirement. So John had little time as a made member, but he had a lot of time as an associate. And he was mentored from the word go by Neil, Neil De La Croce and Carmine Faccio. So this is, you know, mob world wasn't anything strange to him. So they put him right in the driver's seat. Shortly after being a made member in 1977, they make him an acting couple. And it wasn't long after that that he becomes a full-fledged couple when Faccio eventually retires. It was a slow, methodical process. John would report directly to his underboss, which would be Anello de la Croce. So the mentorship of John Gotti would start. De la Croce was a very powerful boss, underboss in the Gambino family. And he was also a part of the the gangsters that immigrated or their people immigrated from Naples. And this type of uh, crew of gangsters in New York City would emerge from the early times of Vito Genovese. And there's a long distinguished role of now the Platano gangsters and John Gotti would also be a part of that with Neil De La Croce. So he was groomed for his position, John Gotti was. But many people assume that he's being groomed just to be a capo. But there is no real information that there was some type of conspiracy to take out Paul Castellano with De La Croce approving it. All the contrary. But I think that De La Croce actually knew that Gatto, Gatti's ego was so big, he wasn't going to stay a couple for long. So in 1980, John's 12-year-old son, tragically, Frank Gotti, would get hit by a car. It was an accident. One of the neighbors... Uh, his son Frank bolted out in between cars and a guy coming back from work in a, a van, work van, uh, couldn't hit the brakes in time, killing the young boy at, at the age of 12. So imagine killing the son of an of a up-and-coming gangster that everybody in the neighborhood knew who he was. And... Uh, uh, obviously, the individual that did the accident, he attempted to apologize to the Gotti family, but he was chased away by the mother of Frank Gotti, the, the young boy, with a baseball bat. And that kind of sealed his feet uh, later on. He would be abducted, that individual, and never to be found again. So... September 1984, John would get in a altercation with a gentleman by the name of Romuald Peck Pecke. Now, this is a, it's a, a funny little thing. The guy was a refrigerator mechanic, and they were arguing over, I think, I believe it was a parking space. Who got there first? And the guy goes to back up, and they beep the horn. And they get into an altercation, of a pushing match. Uh, but this is with Gotti's bodyguard and him, and then Gotti got into it too. Gotti and his bodyguard, they attacked the guy. They even took his wallet or something like that. They took the money out of his wallet. And uh, this guy, not knowing, identifies who did it to him, points him out. And cops uh, later on go, you know, you know who, do you know who he is? No, I don't know who he is. Okay. So... That is, um, again, September 1984. In 1985, John uh, would be indicted along with De La Croce. Um, right after De La Croce started, the underboss 
uh, had cancer and he was doing not doing well. So the indictment that him and Gotti had received, um, they had to prepare for that case, but De La Croce would end up in the hospital slowing the case down. And during that time, uh, in 1985, Gotti was getting antsy, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, that uh, his time was running out. Well, that's what we'll, we'll, we'll say that his time was running out. He knew it. it had nothing to do with that case with uh, the pushing match. The funny part is the New York Post would run in a newspaper article when the case came to trial. The victim would take the stand. They would swear him in. And he had no recollection of anything that occurred and could not point anybody out. And the New York Post put down in the front page, I forgot he. And that was, that was legendary. And, of course, the case was dismissed. Now, let's backtrack a little bit to 1983. Angelo Ruggiero and Gene Gotti, which is John Gotti's brother, would get arrested for dealing and selling in heroin. This is a major no-no in La Costa Nostra. And boss Paul Castellano is fuming hot about it. He is going to bust chops now from 1983 to 1985 that he wants to see the evidence or the tapes that uh, exist in this case. He wants to hear them to get them through the lawyer because he wants to see if they're guilty or not. In other words, if they're on tape talking about dealing in heroin, he's going to pass judgment. Forget the criminal justice system. He was going to kill them both because made members in the Costa Nostra dealing in drugs is a no-no. It's an immediate death sentence. So, De La Croce, which was the underboss, Castellano would tell him, I want to hear the tapes. Well, De La Croce would put it off, you know. Well, Paul, it's going to take time, you know. The lawyers got to get the damn thing, and they just got indicted. So, you know, he put him off for six months, eight months, nine months. And this, this goes on for almost two years. Eventually, De La Croce would end up in the hospital. And uh, Paul would again start demanding he wanted to hear those tapes more and more. De La Croce would die on December 2nd, 1985, of related to cancer. And during, just prior to De La Croce dying on December 2nd, Gotti had already planned out the hit on Paul Costellano. They had already had the hit team, so how they were going to do it. They didn't really know how they were going to do it exactly, pinpoint, because they were moving on Paul Castellano's schedule, not creating the schedule. In other words, I'm not going to call him up, hey, Paul, can you, can you meet me here? And then you kill him. They weren't going to do it like that. They were going to get tipped off on his schedule and then show up. And as a result, uh, Gotti was trying to reach out to De La Croce, when, which was dying in the hospital, for his blessings. But it was said that De La Croce would not approve it, would not go along with it. Uh, the old adage of the boss is the boss is the boss, which the FBI picked that up on tape, De La Croce telling Gotti, a young mentor Gotti, the boss is the boss is the boss. But nevertheless, on December 16th, 1985, 35 years from us doing this podcast, the team that were assembled are heading towards the east side of Manhattan, Spark Steakhouse, and they're about to take out the boss and the underboss of the Gambino crime family, Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellardi, which was the underboss, as they were going to park their car right in front of the restaurant, they were going to take them out. And uh, I know that Sammy the Bull Gravano has a YouTube and a, a podcast which starts today 
and uh, he's going to talk about this, a lot of information that has never gone public, so we'll leave it to the experts. So tune in to Sammy, and I'll post that in the show notes so you can see that podcast or that YouTube where he talks more about that actual hit. Now, right after the hit, days after the hit, the Gambino family uh, would have a meeting through their consulary, right? Because Belair, Bo, Thomas Bellotti and Paul Castellano, boss and underboss, have just been killed. There's no leadership. There's only the consulary now, and that would be Joanne Gallo. So they, cur- they convened, they had to make three people a panel. That's what they were going to call it. Now, Joanne Gallo would const- would stay in his position. He's still third man in the family. But they would bring in Frank DeChico as underboss and John Gotti on the panel too. Now, originally they were just a panel. So they would remain as capos and the consulary. Several days after that, they had conspired, hey, we're going to have a vote of all the captains, and this is what we're going for. And Gotti was Christian, uh, was awarded the Gambino family and Frank DeCiso underboss. And so that, that all fell into place there because there was no secret. Everybody knew who had done it and why they had done it. Basically, Gotti killed Paul Castellano before Paul Castellano killed Gotti. Street rules. This is fair game. John Gotti it was a thug. He was a gangster. He wasn't a sophisticated mafioso like maybe Paul Castellano. He was a pure thug. And he knew the laws of the street. I'm not going to wait for you to take me out. I'm going to take you out. And he did. All right. Um... There was a shortly after that, there was a meeting of the couples and they, they made that approval. Well, from there, uh, the night in 1986, underboss Frank the Chico, Frank the Chico would be killed in a car bombing. Now, the car bombing was the doing of Anthony Gas Pipe Casio and Vic Amuso, the Lucchese Camp crime family under the orders of Vincent de Chin Gigante, which was the chairman of the commission. The commission did not want to have Paul Castellano's hit, whack, killing, whatever you want to call it, without some retribution, because if not, then you're just going around killing bosses. And uh, so the bombing, when they blew up the car that killed Frank DeChico, they actually, he was with a a soldier in the Lucchese family. They exited um, the social club of a guy by the name of Falada, which was a capo in the Cambino family. Gotti was supposed to be there, but he called and canceled that he wasn't going to make it. And... Frank Chico showed up, and then a guy that, you know, same color hair as John Gotti and everything, jumps in the car with Frank Chico, and they thought that that was Gotti, but it was a soldier in the Lucchese family, and they blew up the car and killed them both. So, right after that, it was time to sit down and figure out what in the world has gone wrong. And uh, that would... Uh, come soon enough but prior to those sit downs now there is hostility God he's going to go after uh, Casio that tried to kill him from the Lucchese family so this is getting really stupid remember there had never been a war against one family and another since 1931 and the job of the commission is to avoid this at all costs so they've got to meet at some point. In the meantime, it's shooting duck. 1986-87, uh, Gotti would be uh, labeled the Teflon Don by the, the media because he would win all his cases, even though those cases 
the jury were tampered with and they were paid off. One of them was paid $60,000 to get arrested five years later and get sentenced for it. Now, in 1988, Gotti would meet with the Chin, Vic Amuso of the Lucchese family, of course, the Chin representing the Genovese family, and uh, they would straighten all this out. And there was, you know, you didn't have prior approval, and then Gotti probably told Chin, well, when you try to, when you try to kill Frank Costello, you took a shot at him, they, you know, you didn't have prior approval either. Well, I wasn't boss. I was a made man. I was following orders. But regardless, two wrongs don't make a right. So that meeting kind of, everybody pronounced their innocence. They didn't know what was going on and that peace would be everlasting. But Gotti was making a very hostile movement towards becoming boss of bosses. And on this commission meeting, he asked for Vic Arena which was the acting boss of the Colombo family, to move into that position as acting boss and, and sit on the commission. And it was approved. And so this was a move against Carmine Persigo for, I guess, his blunder of the uh, commission case in 1985. But uh, they saw a way to get rid of Persigo too. But... The chin would stop at Joe Messino, the banana family, say, no, 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 we're not putting the bananas on the commission. They're on timeout since the, the Danny Brasco days when they had Pistone, the FBI agent, as an undercover inform, um, operative inside their family. They, had get, they got kicked out of the commission. Gotti would put the pressure on the New Jersey Del Gavacante family and eventually take control of that. In January 1989, Gotti would, Gotti would be arrested, and eventually, December 11th, 1990, Gotti would be convicted. The government, you see, never took out Gotti. Yeah, they arrested him, and it was hit or miss, fail here, there. Eventually, Gotti got Gotti. Gotti's mouth is what got him in trouble. Gotti's edicts. One of his edicts was in 1988, he ordered all couples had to report to the Ravenite Social Club in Manhattan once a week. This is supposed to be a secret society and they're walking up and down the street in front of the social club and the FBI is having a field day taking pictures. Gotti was hated by all bosses of every family because of his bravado and his stupidity at the same time. He was street smart, but he was boss stupid. And one of the worst bosses in Costa Nostra history. Why? Because too much bravado, too much uh, announcing who you were. Gotti... Uh, Eventually, on June 10th of 2002, at the age of 61, would die of cancer. Nobody from the LCM, from La Costa Nostra, nobody from any other family would attend his funeral. Ultimately, John Gotti was one of the most famous American gangsters in today's era, but probably one of the worst in gangster world. Up next... Episode 172, All Hands Ahoy, from our Buccaneer series. And you can enjoy on our social network, Tactical Thursday, we're going to feature the Romeo 5 Red Dot site from Sig Hour. As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Raider Cobb Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, for your community, and for the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.